Hello everyone. I hope you are all doing well. My name is Chandni Bansal and I have been teaching ACCA for over nine years now, alongside accumulating over 12 years of professional work experience. Today marks the beginning of our journey together in financial accounting. This is an introductory session. And in this session, we'll delve into various aspects, including the syllabus, the exam patterns, the necessary skills, what my teaching methodology going to be, mock exams, and much more. I believe in fostering a dialogue-driven teaching approach where your inputs are going to help shape our discussions. Remember, there's no right or wrong answer here. We are all here to learn and grow together. I am really excited to share my knowledge and practical experiences with all of you, and I look forward to our enriching journey ahead. So this is all about myself. Now let's just jump into the topic and see what all financial accounting has an account for has an account for us. So what is financial accounting? What is this exam? What are we going to do in this? So this particular subject, it aims to develop your knowledge and your understanding of an underlying principles and concepts relating to financial accounting and your technical proficiency in the use of double entry bookkeeping including the preparation of basic financial statements. So all, if you guys have done commerce or you are in 11th or 12th or you're in first year of your college, you are already starting this or in the process of starting this. So this is either it's going to be an enhancement of what you have studied or it's going to be a parallel study of what you are already studying. So all in all, this is a very easy subject. The only crux is you just have to understand it. In this subject, there is no cramming. You do not have to cram anything. You just have to understand the logic behind it, put situations on yourself, and you will get the answer. What the exam structure going to be? It is a computer-based exam. It is an exam on demand. So I would suggest as soon as we complete the syllabus, it is always suggested that you wait for two or three weeks where you're going to practice, revise everything, give your uh, two, three mock exams, and then sit for the final exams. You do not have to wait for a longer period of time because if you're going to do that, then the chances are that you, you know, the information in the back of your head is going to fade away. So let's just not do that. And we will, uh, we, we, we're going to practice a lot of questions in the class. We'll have mock sessions also after and every few chapters are completed so that you are always at par with your study. It's not like that we are just doing study, study, study and no practicing or no revision of things. So no, that's that's not going to work. For students who are going to appear this paper for the first time, the ACCA for the first time, so I'll just quickly explain how do CBE work. So it's a computer-based exam, as told earlier. So the questions will be displayed on the monitor, and you would have to answer directly on the computer. You will have two hours to complete the examination, and as soon as you press Submit, or for your last answer, your result will be there on the screen. You'll get the result then and there. So this is how it works. <laughs> you will know how you have done. If I talk about the exam structure, it will have two sections, section A and section B. Section A consists of 35 objective type questions of two marks each, totaling up to 70 marks. Section B will have two multitask questions of 15 marks each, totaling to 30 marks, so the entire paper becomes 100 marks each. And what are the skills areas required to be successful in FA? Technically, these are the skill areas which you require in each and every subject of ACCN. First is your correct interpretation of the requirements. Always, always read the question with a calm mind. Sometimes when we are like, when we are anxious or when we are too overconfident, we just uh, you know, interpret the question in the wrong manner. And even though we know the answer, we answer it incorrectly. So it's very important that the correct interpretation of the requirements are there. That is what the question is actually asking. Your efficient numerical analysis. You have to see that, you know, how much numericals are there? How will I effectively manage them? Effective writing and the presentation of the answers. Good time management. That is very, very important in ACS here. Managing information. How do you manage all the information that is given in the question? And at last, how do you plan your answers? 
Now, these are your exam success skills if I talk about. What are the ones which are specifically related to essay? That is, how do you approach your objective type questions? So, ideally, the correct way of doing is elimination method. That's what I feel. I personally feel that the elimination method is the best method because sometimes you get confused which is the answer. If you know then and there, fine. If you don't know the answer, let's say for one of the questions you don't know the answer, go with the elimination technique. See which answers, which options are definitely not the answers. Then whatever is left, you can always choose between the two. You have to attempt each and every question. There is no negative marking. So even if you don't know the answer, do inky pinky ponky and please answer it. Maybe it's your luck and you get the right answer. Okay. But never ever leave a question. How do you approach the multitask questions? Then Excel skills. You have to be really good in Excel. So practice as much as you can on your Excel on the laptop. You know, try attempting questions on the screen itself so that it increases your speed. How do you deal with the recoverable text and allowance for receivables? A very important topic and a very favorite topic and the correction of errors. So these are the specific FA skills which are required. Now, once we're going to complete the entire syllabus, when everything is done, what will happen? What are the capabilities you're going to get? You will be able to understand the context and the purpose of financial reporting. Accounting principles, concepts, and the qualitative characteristics all will be on your tip and clear. What is the use of double entry bookkeeping and the accounting systems? How do you record transactions and events? How do you prepare a trial balance? The reconciliation, the bank reconciliation, the trade debtor reconciliation, all will be clear. You will be able to prepare financial statements and after that, you will be able to prepare basic consolidated financial statements and the interpretations of financial statements as well. So these are the main capabilities which you're going to achieve. Now comes how are we going to study? So we will, so ECC has done an amazing job they have provided us with a portal known as Study Hub on the My ECCA website. So if you're gonna, if you all are going to log into your My ECCA website, click on it, put on your details, go to My Qualification, click on it. As soon as you click on it, on the right hand side, the option of Study Hub will appear. Click on it, and I'll show you a screen like this will appear. So it contains the entire syllabus of the FA that is going to be tested, tells you the period. So you are always up to date in terms of the syllabus which you are studying. It, it also has the flashcards for you to revise. The quiz, once you have done everything, you can take parts in the quiz. It has chapter-wise quiz. You can answer them and you will know how well you have done. They also have practice questions. On as per chapters, so we can use that also. Now, if you go to chapters, uh, in each and every chapter, they give you the confidence level, notes, bookmarks, and highlights. Now, what are confidence level? Let's click on a particular topic. Let's say, let's start with this chapter. So, elements of the financial statements. Now, once you've read this chapter, on the right hand side, it says rate your confidence. Now, after doing the uh, particular topic, you have to rate it. Like, how confident you are in this particular topic. Is your confidence level high, medium, or low? Be honest to yourself. It is for your own, uh, you know, it's for your own purpose. Nobody is going to look at it. So if you feel that, you know, I am not that confident, mark it as low. Or if you say I'm very confident, mark it as high. Once you have done it, on this confidence level, the screen will appear as high, medium, low, and it will give you topic-wise. So whichever topics which are medium or low, you can click there, click on them directly and it will take you uh, to that link and you can study them again. You can make notes on your topics, on any of the topics you want. You can bookmark the questions or the areas which you would like to revisit again and you can see them. Or if you feel that something is very important, you would like to revise it again or you know when you're doing your revision, you would like to have a look at it. You can just highlight that particular topic and all those things will come here, here. So this was a brief run through of the study of as to how it works. Now let's jump into this chapter, Elements of Financial Statements and Double Entry, and let's read about it. 
elements of financial statements. Now, I assume that all of you might have seen the financial statements, how they look like. If not, open the newspaper around after March, you will see usually uh, you will see a financial statement one or two in the newspaper because it's it's a requirement for public companies to display their, to put up their financial statements in newspapers. So what in financial statements do we see? The first thing, why a business is running? To earn profit, right? So obviously, whether the business is profitable or not. So basic person would check your statement of profit and loss. See whether the business has profit or it's in, 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 in losses. Next, now only profit and loss do not decide on whether the business is, you know, is going to work as going concern, is going to run as going concern. So the other thing which you would have to look at is your statement of financial position. That's your balance sheet. In other words, where you see that how much assets the company has. It should not be that the company has so many liabilities, so many liabilities that it is not able to, it does not have working capital to work with. So it's probably it's not going to work in long term. So all those things you're going to work came to know, com comes to know from your statement of financial position. Then is your statement of changes in equity, which shows your movement from what was your equity at the start of the year to what is your equity at the end of the year. That is, if there is any new capital that has been introduced or if there is any dividend payment. So all those things come in your statement of changes in equity. Now, there is a fourth, more, fourth more, most important statement as well. That is your statement of cash flow, which is not going to be tested, but still it's very important for you to know. Now, even if the company is on a profit, the company might, might not have cash in hand to operate. Now, how is that possible? Like a person will ask, the company is earning profit. Where is the money going? So, the best example is, let's say I am in the business of selling bags. Okay. I sold 100 bags and let's say I earned a profit of 10,000 on those 100 bags. But I'll still say I don't have money in, in my hand to, you know, to do any other things. So, where is that money gone? And so, the reason I don't have money in the hand is because probably the I sold those bags on debt um, uh, to my debtors for a period where they agreed that they're going to pay me in a period of three months. So I did sell them. I did record a profit, but I don't have cash in hand. So those are the kind of situations where you actually want to understand where is the cash going? Where is the cash piled up? Or probably I have a very less credit term with my creditors. So I need to pay my liabilities very quickly. So you would see that in the cash flow that my liabilities are very, very less. So that's the reason I do not have cash in hand. So all those things to understand where the cash is actually blocked, you can only come to know from your statement of cash flow. Then comes your double entry bookkeeping. So double entry bookkeeping consists of two things, duality concept and the accounting equations. Now, what are these? What is duality concept? So the dual aspect concept of accounting, it relates to the idea of double entry bookkeeping. Every transaction affects the business in at least two aspects. These two aspects, they are equal and opposite in nature. So if you do a sale of let's say 10,000, so you're going to get 10,000 cash in return. So it will be equal. The amount will be equal. So this, it is also known as your accounting equivalence concept in other words. So if I have to explain it, let's say to ensure a comprehensive and complete record, it is necessary to make two entries to record each transaction. So this concept is based on the assumption that a business never truly owns anything. So anything that a business has, uh, let's say the assets, is owed either to the outsiders, that is to whom the liabilities are, or to the owners who is a separate legal entity, that is your capital. Either it belongs to someone whom you have to pay because you have purchases, let's say you have bought the assets on bank loan. So the assets belong to the bank, right? But if you have bought up the assets from your very own uh, capital amount, then it belongs to the shareholders or it belongs to the owners if you are a sole proprietor. Hence, when a business gets anything, it must record both the facts, an increase in the liabilities 
and an increase in sorry an increase in the assets or an increase in liability or the capital similarly when anything that leaves the business there is a reduction in the assets or a corresponding reduction in either liability or the capital so this fact applies to all the transactions that a business may enter into any stage of its existence so <clears throat> there are two types of claims against the assets of the business one of the owners and another of the creditors so we can always say that the total assets of a business they are equal to its liabilities so as a, here we comes to the accounting equation where it says assets are equal to liabilities plus capital so we're going to study further in detail as to what are liabilities what are assets what are capital in a next way so now we're going to talk about the elements of statement of financial position so we understand that it consists of three things assets liabilities and capital now what are these not alien words let's read them assets as per the definition of ias 1 assets it defines an asset as a present economic resource controlled by the entity due to some past events and has the potential to produce economic benefits now let's break down the sentence number 1 it's a present economic resource you have it currently with you okay it's your economic resource it is controlled by the entity you have you have the ownership of it nobody else has the ownership the business has the ownership of it due to some past events that is you purchased them in the past you made the payment and now they belong to you and has the potential to produce economic benefit so when you going to sell them back again in future you'll get some money out of it right even if the product gets old and you want to sell it as scrap you still going to get some money now assets can be split into two categories current assets and non current assets current assets they are those assets which can be readily convertible into cash within the span of next 12 months if yes you have an asset which can be converted into cash within next 12 months that is your current assets so current assets usually covers your working capital your cash your inventory your debtors so all these are your current assets when i talk about non current assets non current so whatever is not current assets it's actually your non current assets that is the assets that a business uses for more than 12 months to generate profits or cash flow example your buildings your machinery your plants your offices shops warehouses computer equipment production equipment all those things now these non current assets they can also be further split into two categories so one is tangible another one is intangible so what are tangible tangible you can touch them so all those non current assets that have a physical form and they can be touched they are known as your tangible non current assets example your machinery fixtures fittings your offices shops warehouses computer equipments all these are your tangible non current assets intangible non current assets they are those non current assets that don't have a physical form example your software licenses your uh, patents trademarks goodwill so all those things are your intangible non current assets now it is very important that we understand the categories of these assets whether they are current assets or non current assets only then we can you know separately show them in the statement of financial position now we have an activity also now study hub is very good in the aspect that they give you activity questions also so you can test your knowledge then and there whether or not we have understood the concept so let's do this one together uh so we have to state whether they whether it's true or false so the first one is a telephone that is used daily is a current asset now let's understand this i have a business uh let's say i sell bags okay now i have 10 employees with me and i have given each and every employee the telephone that you know they can uh, answer uh, the customer queries if it comes up or they have to call the manufacturers or you know they have to call the delivery agent anybody i've just given them the phones do you think i've given them the phone so that i will sell them within a span of next 12 months i'll sell out the phone 
No, that's my actually that's my non-current assets. And that's for use. That's for my business. It's not for selling purposes. So that's why it's false. A telephone that is used daily, it's not a current asset. It's a non-current asset. Next one. A machine used to create products is a tangible non-current asset. It's a machine. Can we touch it? Yes, it has got a physical form. So yes, that's right. It is a tangible asset. Whether it is a current or a non-current asset, a machine is used to create products which is which is going to help run my business. So yes, it's I'm not going to sell it within period of one year. So yes, it is a non-current asset. So this statement is true. Third one. A software license that allows a business to use specific period, specific software for a period of three years is a tangible non-current asset. It's a software. How can it be tangible? It does not have a physical form, right? So the statement is false. A truck a business uses to deliver goods to its customer is a tangible non-current asset. A truck has a physical form? Yes. It is going to remain in the business to deliver the goods to the customer? Yes. For a longer period of time? Yes. So that means the statement is true. It is a tangible non-current asset. Next. Goods purchased by a business for resale to its customers are tangible non-current assets. Now, if I have, if I have goods and I have, uh, I have purchased from, let's say, another business and I want to resale them, why will they be tangible non-current assets? Because non-current assets are those whom you are not, you have no intention of selling them within a period of one year, right? But obviously, I want to sell those goods. Now, because I don't want to keep the goods in warehouses. What will I do? I will not earn any money out of it. So, this is false. They are your tangible, uh, sorry, they are your current assets. They are not your tangible non-current assets. With this, we come to the next section that is liabilities. Now, IAS1 defines liability as a present obligation of the entity to transfer an economic resource as a result of past events. Let's break it down. Present obligation of the entity, that the entity has to pay it now. Transfer an economic resource. Transfer cash out of the business. As a result of past events, something in the past, you might have purchased something or you might have taken a loan. So all those kinds of a thing, you, as a result in the past, you have to oblige for it now. So a liability is owned by a business. So it implies legal responsibilities or duties to the other parties. Similarly, like assets, liabilities can also be split into two categories, current and non-current. So all those uh, amounts that are owed by the business, which fall due for payment, Within one year of the reporting date, they are known as your current liabilities. Example, your creditors. And if they fall for beyond one year from the reporting date, they are your non-current liabilities. Example, bank loans. Now, there is a catch. When we take a bank loan, what, is, what, what usually the bank says? Does the bank say, okay, fine, don't pay me for one year. After one year, start paying me something. Does it happen? No. Bank says, fine, you have to start paying me. You, you have to pay me as an EMI, right? Pay me every month or pay me every quarter or pay me, you know, half yearly, something like that. But you have to make start making some payments slowly and gradually, which keeps on increasing. Or you have a span, let's say, I took a loan for five years. So in the first year, I would be paying some, EM, uh, I would be paying some principal in interest. In second year, I would be paying some. In third year, I would be paying some. It's a complete schedule as per the interest rate. Now, when we have a bank loan and when we are presenting it in the statement of financial position, we're going to divide the bank loan into two parts. One would be shown under current liabilities. That is the amount which, is, which we're going to pay within one year. And the rest of the amount that is after one year, that's the four-year period, remaining four-year period which we have to pay is going to be shown in your non-current liabilities. Next is your capital or equity. A business capital or equity balance is the residual interest owners hold in its assets after deducting all its liabilities. So when you have, uh, 
dividing the accounts in your assets and liabilities. So whatever is left is actually your capital. It is the investment that has been done in the business entity and is sometimes also called, called as the net worth of the business. With this, we have completed the elements of statement of financial position. Now let's move on to the next topic. That is elements of the statements of profit or loss. <clears throat> Sorry. So there are two absolute profit measures, only one of which is shown in the trading account. First of all, is your gross profit. This is your, this is calculated in the trading account and it shows the access of sales over cost of goods sold. It does not include any other expense. So <clears throat> this is not the actual picture of your profit. This is not your actual profit, not your real profit. Net profit is the profit which is calculated in the PNL and it is the remaining profit after you have deducted all the other costs incurred in the period after from your gross profits. Let's say for example, um, as I'm into let, same example, let's say I sell, sell bags. So from the revenue, I deducted the cost of goods sold of preparation of those, like of the making of those bags and I got the gross profit. But is that my real profit? No. Why? Because I've incurred all other expenses. For example, I have hired staff for, uh, you know, arranging <clears throat> who can look after the man, who can manage the business. I've hired delivery agents who are going to make the delivery. I've done, I've spent marketing costs. So all those costs are actually my cost for the business, right? So they need to be deducted from the revenue to find out what is my actual net profit. So <clears throat> the statement of PNL is a formal presentation of the trading and the profit and loss accounts. And it summarizes the organization's financial performance in income and expenses during the financial year. Now, if I talk about what is income, Income is increases in assets or your decreases in liabilities that results in increases in equity other than those relating to the contribution from holders of the equity. We are not talking about the uh, induction of the new capital from the shareholders. No, we are talking about in general your increase in your assets or your decrease in your liability. So whenever a sale is occur, sale is occurring, that whenever sale is recognized, your goods are dispatched. And that's when you are actually generating income. <clears throat> so what is income? It reflects all the sales made to customers. Regardless whether they have been paid or they have not been paid, you have to record it as an income. It's an accrual based concept. So we do accrual accounting, not cash accounting. We do not account for that when the cash will be received. That's when we're going to record sales. No. If you have done the sale, it does not matter whether you have received the cash or not, you're going to book it as a sale. Similarly, for expenses, what are expenses? <clears throat> they are your decrease in assets or increase in liabilities that results in decrease in equity other than those relating to the distributions to the holders of equity claims. Similarly, expenses, we do not include any kind of dividends we are paying out to the shareholders. Those are not expenses. That is just distribution of your profit. Expense is the day-to-day -day running cost that has been incurred. Okay, Cost of sale is your cost of goods sold that have been sold. And other expenses are your electricity, rent, salaries, interest pay, marketing expense, advertising expense, all those expenses. So those are your expenses. So <clears throat> PNL is includes two things, income and expenses. Then we have an activity too also. So let's try and do this one. Uh, in the following activity, classify the list of elements, items into the elements of financial statements. So first one is shareholders investment. Now what is shareholders investment? Shareholders are investing something. So whenever shareholders are inducing something into the business, it's equity, right? Computers. <clears throat> what are computers? Computers are of tangible assets. Bookkeeper's annual salary. It is an so salaries are an expense for us. It's a PL item and it's an expense. Warehouse. What is warehouse? Can we touch a warehouse? Yes. 
Do we maintain warehouse to be sold within a period of less than 12 months? No, it's for more than 12 months. So warehouse is, <clears throat> is your tangible non-current asset. Unsold goods. Now what are unsold goods? Unsold goods are your inventory. So they are a part of your current assets. They are in year end inventory. Overdraft in the bank. If it's an overdraft in the bank, means it's a liability. We have to pay back to the bank. Cash held at bank, it's a normal cash account which we are maintaining. So it's a current asset. <clears throat> Sale of goods for cash in the factory shop. What is happening? We are just selling of the goods. So we are generating income for the business. So that's why it is an income to be recorded in your PNL account. Okay, with this, we are done with activity two. Activity three, I think I would suggest give a read through on your own and then probably we can discuss it in the next session. Thank you so much for today, guys.